Good morning and welcome. Nice to have you back, John. It's good to be back. <laughs> welcome to Wells Church. A few weeks ago, John was preaching, and uh, something came up during the service, and he made mention that we should, something to the extent, we should keep our eyes open and be aware of what God's doing for us today. Looking at it a little bit differently, it's, let's pay attention to how God is blessing us every day. It's not just big things. It's not just life-saving moments or, or something that goes right or, or saves us from, from certain peril. More likely, it's the tiniest little details of life that make all the difference in the world. It's the beauty to be found in a flower that's blooming. It's, it's, a, it's a hummingbird that comes by. These are all blessings from God. Everything we do every day is a blessing from God. And if you pay attention and you look for them, you'll find them and you'll be happy. And it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or black or white or in pain or in health. There's blessings every day for every single one of us. And the more we pay attention to those blessings, the less likely we'll be paying attention to our pains or our hurts or our fallings or our failings. So go out there and pay attention today to how God's blessing you, and you'll be amazed at how blessed we really are every day. And we'll call the worship now. Thank you, choir. Please stand for the opening sentences. We are gathered in God's holy presence, the one who etches grace on our hearts. This is the place where God will transform us into the disciples. Please share the prayer. God, we give you glory, you who yearns for justice not just for the favored few, but for the least in our world. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing all verses of hymn 354, I Surrender All.
So if you surrender all, then that means you, you want to do an affirmation of faith, right? So if you will, if you're not familiar with it, turn to page 881 as we affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty. In our lectionary gospel passage this morning, it's, it's the parable of the persistent widow who goes to the judge and just refuses for him not to give her justice. And we'll hear it in a little bit. But as I thought about that passage this week, two words kept coming to my mind. My wife and I, a long time ago, were in some kind of a marriage conference that the Baptists make their ministers go through to make sure, you know, the wife's not going to kill the husband for being stupid which might be a good idea for all couples, I don't know. But anyway, we were at this, this retreat, and they asked her one word to describe your spouse. And it had to be clean. It had to be clean, James. Go ahead. Cleansed. Who worked in art and ever more so good? Um, and she said the word passion, which I kind of thought was a cool word, but passion can be also misguided, but passion can also turn into boldness. The thing that I was the most passionate about from probably fourth grade through my sophomore year of college was basketball. If there was a game to be found, if there was a rim to shoot at without a net on a telephone pole somewhere, I was going to be, be playing. I grew up at the original Broadmoor, not the other one. And they had a gym. There was a guy named Mr. Bewley. And Mr. Bewley was the minister of recreation. And I probably learned more about grace and love in a Christian way from that man than, than maybe anybody I've ever known. But it was a great babysitting place because on Friday nights, your parents could drop you off at 6, pick you up at 10. On Saturday mornings, the place opened at 8.30 and closed at 4.30. And then when I got in high school, I had a key so I could go anytime and go shoot. One whole wall in my room had nothing but Sports Illustrated pictures cut out and stapled to the wall of a montage. When we moved from that house, my dad, had to, he, made, he made me use like three buckets of mud just to cover up the, the holes that the staples had left. But I had a spotlight that I would shoot outside, and if the spotlight wouldn't work, I'd back my car out and I'd shoot. And my neighbors were always calling my parents saying, he needs to go to bed or he needs to get, because it was just constantly. And it wasn't just me, because my friends knew that I played. So, and then we got our driver's license, right? And we'd go to Span and to Casey. And those goals were only nine and a half feet. And we played what white people called ego ball. <laughs> that meant we could dunk, you know? And, and so the older I got, the more I got involved with basketball and it became a passion, but it also became a way to share the gospel with a lot of people. Uh, my first time in seminary, which was many moons ago, I played on a semi-pro team in Fort Worth, and uh, we were called the Crusaders, which I hated the name. But we would always have um, a short prayer, and we would talk with the other team after the game. Um, and it was usually hard for them to talk because we were always just beating the mess out of everybody. Um, I never met a shot I didn't like, and if they'd had the three-point shot when I was playing basketball, I would, I would hold the record. Because Steve Reeves always says, Brazier, why don't you pull up and take the 25-footer when you got a layup? Because it's more fun to hear the string from way out, you know. But basketball was my passion. And it made me bold. 
it made me bold enough that five white guys plus myself used to play in a summer league at White Rock Gym. And when we first walked in, everybody just looked at us. And then after we played and won, they were all like, man, them some bad white boys. And we got to be friends. And I realized that being bold in basketball and passionate about it could also transfer to be passionate about my faith and to be bold about my faith. Um, so when you think about the scripture this morning, even a little bit of the psalmist, if you're bored during the service, pick your Bible. None of you bring your Bibles anyway. Uh, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. You can look it up on your phone. It's probably easier. But the psalmist has some interesting things to say that goes along with what this um, widow was praying to the judge about today. So if you don't hear me say anything else, you have the opportunity to be passionate about your faith and you have the opportunity to be bold because Paul said that he does not give you a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and discipline. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us for just a few moments to gather in this place. Your spirit's connectedness here is amazing. The people that are here, your people, are amazing. Help us to be passionate about our lives, about what we believe in. And to be bold when we proclaim that. Not in an arrogant, self-serving way. But in a confident, sure, kind, gracious way. Help us to live our lives as Jesus taught us to live in the prayer that he taught us to pray. And say, our Father, who art in heaven. Grace and peace be with you. Thanks, y'all. Please stand as we sing all verses of hymn number 451, Be Thou My Vision, <clears throat> with bold passion. <laughs>
please remain standing as we share Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6 on page 750. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament <coughs> proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them God has set a tent from the sun which comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and runs its course with joy like a strong man. Its rising is from the end of the heaven and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hid from its heat. Take time now to turn to one another with love and joy and peace and welcome. Okay, let's get together. Let's get together. <laughs> okay. James and thank you very much dear brothers and sisters it's great to see you today it's lovely weather outside our prayer is always that God's Sun might shine inside in your hearts every single Sunday we have at the end of the service the hymn of invitation and uh, that means you're always invited to come to come to profess your faith in Christ um, for a special prayer or perhaps even to do something even more unusual and that is to join the church and so we said that this Sunday, we are going to have a join the church opportunity for anybody that would like to do so. And this is that time. In just a moment, uh, our eminent musician is going to lead us in blessed be the tie that binds. And if this is the Sunday you've decided to do it, then please come down to the front as we do that. We also invite those of you to join those who might come so that we can share that prayer together like we do. Okay, Mr. James, here we go. kind of get toward the altar here so uh, in just a minute we're going to kneel you down uh, let's begin with a word of prayer please I dear father it's a beautiful thing to find you and then to find one another and then to find a place that in terms of our spiritual life feels like home for us we thank you for these persons who have been coming many and some who will be 
just begun to come and for their willingness now to want to be an on the record part of our church. That's a wonderful thing. It's beautiful and it's holy and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we ask it, amen. Before we kneel at the altar together, those of you new members are stand if we can't kneel. Uh, a couple of questions that we need to ask you and the first question is this, do you believe that God speaks to us from the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament as the Holy Spirit helps us to understand the meaning of the word of God in this day and time? To each of you who are about to join our particular church, profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as you understand what that means at this point in your spiritual journey. To each of you make a commitment to support this particular <coughs> branch of the Church of God with your presence, your gifts, your love, and your service. That's the commercial. <laughs> <laughs> and more important than anything else, in your heart of hearts, is it your desire to be a part of this community of faith called Wells Church? Will those who are going to join either a kneel or remain standing right there as the rest of us reach out to them? <coughs> Let's get a hold of each other's hands. Our Father, you know, family is comprised of people who love and who live in a loving way. And we are family here, and we thank you for these new members of our household, for these persons who have now decided in their heart and in their heads as well, to join our church. We pray that we might be faithful to them and they to us. Hear us now as the church prays for these who join. Holy Spirit of God, Holy Spirit of God we thank you for this good moment. We pray your blessings and your peace. And a sense of satisfaction, and a sense of satisfaction in our own hearts, in our own hearts and, in and in the hearts of these who join. That we'll, pursue your work that we'll pursue your work and be your people, and be your people. Under, your under your inspiration. In Christ. In Christ. Amen. 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 Y'all are all members now. We have a little cup to give you with an information sheet. And if you fill it out, that'd be good. Here we come. All right. Uh, David was asking if y'all would stick around for just a minute after church because he'd like to get a quick picture of you. Can you do that? If you will do that. Uh, this is probably totally inappropriate, but when I was very young and we were really moved by the moment, we had something that we all said. And this is the translation from the French. Hot dog, cold cats, fried mosquitoes, and buttered rats. <laughs> It's, it, it's, it's a happy day, and uh, we're always glad that we have the chance to share a little bit of happiness together because heavens knows that the world is a mess out there. Um, and so it's good to be able to bear witness to laughter and bear witness to a little tear, too, when that's necessary. Wednesday will be our oral uh, project, our oral history project. Please do come out. We'll have a lovely supper, and we'll have a program that... Um, sort of includes history and history making. And so bring friends and come out. You want to add anything to it, James? Just please do come. And if you did come to the last uh, uh, program, we need to do a survey as well. Um, so just give us uh, some information. There's a survey that uh, Jane has put up. Uh, it's not on the website yet. It'll go back up. It is on the website. Yes. On the email blast, rather. I always get the two mixed up. Okay. But please do fill out the form, and please do come. Uh, Sarah Campbell has been doing a, a wonderful job of coordinating that, and I do hope that you'll come and support us all, and maybe learn something. Because we're looking back at the future, what we back at the future. Isn't that <laughs> That'll work.
Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, dear. Okay, youth and children together. Good. Um, next Sunday, we have a special treat. Our lay ministers are very special treats each week. But uh, some of you may have seen the article in the paper in the Clarence Ledger about Maggie Wade Dixon. And uh, I wrote a little piece about that in one of the posts. And she wrote a real nice comment back. And so I wrote her and said, how'd you like to be the lay minister in charge of the service? And she said, I knew I was in trouble. And uh, so she wrote back and said she'd be honored. And so she will be our lay minister at 11 o'clock next Sunday morning. Uh, I'll be preaching at 11 o'clock for the rest of this month. John and I have kind of conferred, and he was sweet and kind about that, uh, because the week after that is the Wells Fest check. Um, Maggie's grandmother named her Magnolia. And when Maggie said, why? The grandmother said, because it's a strong tree and a pretty flower. And so I'm going to preach on strong tree, pretty flower. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. But anyway, then the next week is going to be really exciting because we have the check already, um, and we're going to give it to you. And I'll just tell you this, it's more than $50,000. So God is really good about that. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Somebody said, um, how can you give away money if you're trying to raise money and if raising money is not easy? Uh, because giving away money is what we're about. And God will help us to raise what we must have for the church to, to happen. And if he doesn't, then we'll make whatever adjustments are necessary, you know, because it's a faith thing anyway. A uh, wonderful opportunity with uh, Dr. Uh, Jeff Parker. We'll be doing our, he's our minister of counseling here. We'll be doing uh, some grief classes. Notice that on four consecutive Wednesday evenings. Um, we're so proud for those who came in today. The Altar Flowers by Morella Hennigan in celebration of John's birthday. And the Entrance Flowers by Charles Mangum in remembrance of Kimberly Mangum's birthday. Um, lost Kimberly this last year. Uh, trunk or treat next week. You want to add anything to it or are you about ready? No, okay. Well, we got it down the wrong time. Get ready to trunk or treat. Okay. Okay. Two weeks from today will be trunk or treat out in the parking lot, weather permitting. So if you would like to either set up a vehicle or if you would like to just, you know, donate candy or, you know, anything, um, we'll let me know if so we know how many cars to plan for. Um, and if you just plan on attending, um, we're looking forward to seeing you. So costumes or no costumes, all you need to bring is, um, or not you, your child. <laughs> yeah. We have a fun time with that. Um, one of the things I suggested one year was that you wear the costume of someone you admire rather than a ghost or a goalie. Um, got that idea years ago from Bob, Bob Katiski, and that was interesting because I um, had some different people bring in different ideas. But what's funny, if, if the adults dare to wear a costume, the kids will say things like, I didn't know they were crazy, you know, or would they really do that? So it's neat, it's a good time together. Any other announcements? That need, announcement needs to be made briefly now. We need to move. Okay, let's do our prayer request. What's on your mind and heart? And uh, let's share our prayers. Yes, my dear. Okay. Okay, are you better? You feeling better and better? Good. That's good. And. Okay. Please continue to pray for Jim Walters, who is having the seventh surgery in four months. Uh, at the hospital bill. Okay, we'll remember. Yes, John. Uh, I was talking with James Mason right before this service in Bruce Reynolds. <laughs> Let's give him a hand. I don't let him take that home. Come on, baby. Okay. Okay. Are we ready? Let's pray, please. 
funny. Sometimes we get so busy being church, doing it, that we forget all about praying. Letting you speak to us in a quiet moment. Allowing us to name names about people we care about, people we love. You already know their needs. We share them, and together we become partners. Our concern max, match together with yours. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Each of them in Christ. Amen. Amen. Birthdays and anniversaries, yes. Okay. Yes, my dear. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, John. Okay, Liz. Okay. Philip. Okay, son and a grandson. Yes, dear Kay. Okay, daughter in law. Okay. Craig. My birthday is the fifty third Thursday and my first cousin the twenty second. Okay. All right. Balcony. Yes, yes. Yeah. Sister today and two, three cousins passed. Okay. Yes, John John. daughter Evelyn on Thursday. Okay. Yeah, he did. Yes. Best friend Roberta. Best friend Roberta. Okay, are we ready? Here we go, John. Y'all remember the song I'm gonna lay my burden down? We're gonna let you lay the burden down of your tithe and offering right now. So let's receive them. Come on, guys. Here come the ushers. Hey, while they're coming, let me tell you something. Thank you very much for your support. You know, we don't talk about that a lot around here because God meets our needs, but we appreciate every single, every single commitment from every one of you. Bless you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, our tithe, our offering, it's a good thing for us to do that. We're just giving you back a piece of life that you gave to us in the first place. So bless the gift and the giver in Christ. Amen. Sing God a simple song, loud, a loud Make it up as you go along, loud, a loud Sing like you like to sing, God. All simple things for God is the simplest of all. For God is the simplest of all. Sing the Lord a new song To praise him, to bless him, to bless the Lord I will sing his praises while I live All of my days Blessed is the man who loves the Lord Blessed is the man who praises him Louder, louder, louder And walks in his ways I will lift up my voice To the hills from whence comes my help I will lift up my voice to the Lord Singing louder, louder My shade is 
the shade upon my right hand, and the sun shall not smite me by day, nor the moon by night. Blessed is the man who praises him, louder, 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 and walks in his way.
Thank you, Jamie, James, choir. I think they said that was for you, John Garner. So, very nice, very nice. I invite you, if you're able, to look on the back of your order of service, and as you do, please stand for the reading of the gospel. I'll be reading the Luke passage from the message. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And Peterson translates it this way. Jesus told them a story showing that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and never quit. He said, There once was a judge in some city who never gave God a thought and cared nothing for people. A widow in that city kept after him. My rights are being violated. Protect me. He never gave her the time of day, but after this went on and on, he said to himself, I care nothing of what God thinks and even less of what people think. But because this widow won't quit badgering me, I'd better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to end up beaten black and blue by her pounding. The gospel of our Lord for the people of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Seminary is really teaching me some things. Yes, I didn't want to go. I went kicking and screaming, but now I'm glad I'm there. And one little tidbit that I hadn't thought about sharing, but I will share with you. This is the early Methodism period. It's when Wesley is really starting to form, to, to go out and preach, unlike the, an Anglican church leader would. But the first four or five years after 1739, when he had this little Aldersgate experience, and that was on our test midterm last week, and yes, ladies and gentlemen, your associate pastor was one of only three to get it correct. And he dropped the question. Anyway, that's a whole other story. But after 1739, he was making 28 pounds a year. And he said if he could just save and live on 26 pounds, and he could save and give two to the poor. And he did that for the next five years of his life, even though his salary increased exponentially. And so you kind of see where this Wells method of giving over raising for yourself happens. So I think that comes a lot from Keith Tonkel as well. But to be taught and to learn something new requires that you be open to learning, open to new things, to not trying to be an expert on everything about everything. And I mentioned that kind of about Gaydon during his service. So there wasn't anything Gaydon didn't know anything about. He knew something about everything, you know. But he was always seeking to learn more things, hence he was always asking more questions. I texted Jamie this past week, and I said, you wonder if God's tired of Gaden's questions yet? <laughs> you know. But, but to, to, to want to learn, you have to be open to learning. The tradition that I grew up at the time frame and when we grew up, and many of you grew up at the same time, the Bible was used as a rule book. It was all about the things you do and don't do. And while I believe that there are lots and lots and lots of valuable lessons in Scripture that we need to follow, the view that the Bible is a rule book poses a lot of difficulties for me. For, for, time, for me, I just don't know sometimes what rules apply to us and our communities this day as they applied 50 years ago is they applied when the New Testament was written. Another difficulty about rules is for me, and you can ask Mr. Jesse Howell at prep, God rest his soul, um, rules are easy to break. They really are. And so we become discouraged when we realize that we've broken rules or we end up judging others who live by the rules and break our rules even though they may not be their rules and we judge them accordingly. Today we hear about a different kind of instruction, something to be open to as Jesus talks to the disciples. And it's something that I think God really wanted to just place upon their heart that this is the most important thing about everything about being a Christian. Is that when we pray, God instruction rests within us and it transforms us through our relationship with God and when we pray to God, there is a holiness that is inside of us that awakens because we are speaking with God. And I'll give you an example. 
Sometimes we can say things to God that we can't say to anybody else. I got a text this week from a very dear friend going through some very rough times with their family. And this is the text that this person sent. I'm so anguished and confused over why all, all caps, this continues. How and when exactly did our lives become so far wrong that God has turned a deaf ear? You know who sent that text? My wife. To me. It's real. You think you do all the things you're supposed to do. You live the way you're supposed to live. And the world and life just keeps beating you down. And the propheticness of this passage this week for me has been, God, I'm going to keep beating your door down until, until you listen, until something happens. Because it's devastating. As many as you know, I had to get rid of my, my, um, my go-kart car in order to tra travel back and forth to Memphis. But the car that I really fell into getting was a gift from the Lord, I believe. But uh, it has Bluetooth audio, therefore I can stream Pandora from my phone. <laughs> and I awoke in Thursday morning to the news on Good Morning America with Robin Roberts saying that, that Robert Zimmerman, a.k.a. Bob Dylan, received the Nobel Peace Prize for poetry, right? So, you got a lot of nerve. Um, <laughs> So I put it on Bob Dylan radio for my trip to Memphis. And I'm, I'm kind of praying and, and agonizing because they're giving back the midterm exams on Thursday. And, you know, it's the first exam you've taken in 16 years and you want to do well and all. But you, I'm really praying because of what's going on. And Tom Waits comes on. You know, I realize he's got one of the most melodic voices that you've ever heard. But he comes on, and it's a song called Day After Tomorrow. And I'd heard it a few times before, but this phrase caught me. You can't deny the other side don't want to die any more than we do. What I'm trying to say is don't they pray to the same God we do? Tell me, how does God choose? Whose prayers does he refuse? Who turns the wheel? And who throws the dice on the day after tomorrow? The widow kept badgering and badgering and badgering and badgering. And it's really no different than the man who had somebody come to his house and had no food. And he goes next door and beats on his neighbors. And finally the neighbor gets just so incessantly ticked off at him that he says, Yeah, here, you can have this, go cook. I think part about being consistently praying, regardless of what answer you're getting, is that that's part of being holy. Wesley talks a lot about being justified by faith. He had a hard time with it, that your faith could make you justified in God's eyes through Christ. And that once you become justified through your faith in Christ, you begin to be sanctified. And the Commodores really have a good song on sanctified, but I'm not going to go there. But it, it's a process. Your sanctification is when you start doing holy things because you've been prodded by the Spirit, because your faith tells you, this is what I need to do. My dad, who's, who adopted me when I was four months old, and my mom from right over there on Northwest Street, thank God they adopted me and changed my name to John because the people there had called me Melvin. <laughs> you know. I know some Melvins, but I just don't look like one, I don't think, you know. But that's a whole other thing. But my dad gave, gave me the greatest gift that I think any dad can give a father or any person can give to anybody else, and that they simply, he simply believed in me. Even when I failed, he encouraged me, you know. Sometimes I was a jerk when I failed, but he was never a jerk in not believing in me. I was talking with, with uh, our horticulturist theologian this week, Lloyd Moncrief. 
and we're talking about some of the things going on in life, and I was talking to them about this prayer. And he says, you know, my dad used to tell me that failure is nothing but another opportunity. And so if you think God is not listening to your prayers and he's failing to answer them, then maybe that's an opportunity for you to continue to pray. When you start to doubt that you exist, remember this. God believes in you and everything about you. The psalmist has a passion for God's instruction. If you look at the psalm reading for today, as I was getting the order of service ready for, for Sunday, I kept hearing the, the hymn, I Surrender All, over and over my head. And I sent James, because I usually let James pick out the, the hymns, because, I mean, he is kind of the minister of music, right? And I don't have Keith's gifts for, like, picking out hymns. But I said, if we can do I Surrender All, because I think it, it speaks to what we do every time we go to God's throne. You're saying, I surrender all, and, and here's how I surrender to you. Richard Rohr said this week in one of his devotions, Jesus was not changing the Father's mind about us. He was changing our mind about God and thus about one another. With God... It's the idea that the teacher's presence can be more important than the lessons. That's true. But God's instruction should help us become kinder, gentler, better people. The point, I believe, of this is that being a Christian is not about meeting certain standards and getting it all right. It's about getting to know God. And the way you get to know God is the same way you get to know people on earth. You develop relationships with them. You communicate with them. You cry with them, you laugh with them. This, the, the title of this sermon today comes from Jimmy Valvano's speech only months before he died from cancer. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Derek Wittenberg, 35 feet, New Mexico, Final Four, 1988, nothing but air. Lorenzo Charles from nowhere grabs it, slams it home. NC State beats Goliath, the Houston Cougars, and wins the NCAA National Championship. A few years later, Valvano is giving his last speech before he dies. Whatever you do, he said, in your day, think. It's always good to think to expand your knowledge, to learn something new, to laugh. you got to laugh. And if you have a problem laughing, I'll give you Keith Ferguson's phone number and you can call him and you will be laughing before the phone call is over. It's a promise. And he said cry. If you can think and laugh and cry, then that's been a pretty good day. And I think that's what God is selling us. This parable here, some people look at it. Jesus told the disciples on praying. He says, never give up. There are two characters in the parable. An obnoxious judge and a lowly old widow. Truly a mismatch in society, correct? The only weapon the widow had was persistence. This is for all the lonely people thinking that life has passed them by. Don't give up until you drink from the silver cup and ride that highway in the sky. And I'll leave you with this. Pray, even in your darkest hour, as if you would sell your soul for an answer. Amen. Amen. If you will, turn to page 30 in the hymnal. And before we go any further, I want to do something we don't do much in church. I want us to take about 30 seconds of being quiet and sort of let God speak in his own way.
Thank you, dear God. Amen. Let's share together the prayer of humble access and the three old Lamb of God versions, if you will. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy man. We are not worthy so much as to gather up crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to partake of this sacrament of thy Son, Jesus Christ, that we may walk in newness of life, may grow into his likeness, and may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. O Lamb of God, that take time to time we talk about the mystery of our faith and there is a mystery in holiness some we understand some we don't and when we do things like the sacrament there is mystery there we use words we interpret those words each of us in our own way but the simple truth is that the act of communion is God's invitation to each of us to come to the table of grace and to receive our fair share and so on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, given, broken for you. And then when the meal was over, he took the cup and blessed it. And he gave it to the disciples and he said, all of you drink from this. It's the new covenant the new agreement, the new deal, in my very life substance, in my very own blood. And every time you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And so, thank God, the altar is open to whosoever will come. And as we come this morning, for those of you who are visiting, simply take the bread and dip the cup, and when you are ready to leave the altar, arise and go in peace. I'm going to ask Ken and Stephanie if they will come to the altar to help John and myself as we serve today's sacrament. As soon as we're in place, please come. Please come, dear brothers and sisters.
Two fit three fifty two. It's me, O oh Lord. What are you doing? You standing in the later place. Yeah. Yeah.
Sunday school. We got a lot of great classes. There's even one that discusses all the classes <coughs> of rock and roll and it meets here in the parlor. Great class. There's other ones too. Join hands as we have our benediction song. Yeah. 